that word seminary has, has earned some negative uh, connotations in our, in our day. And that's unfortunate because that's not really something that the word should have. It shouldn't have negative connotations because seminary comes from the word semen, which means, of course, seed. And God's word is seed. And originally, a seminary meant a garden plot, a place where seed was planted and it was developed and it grew, it was cultivated. And, uh, you know, in 1 Corinthians 3, verse 9, it says that we, the body of Christ, are God's field under cultivation. So the whole body of Christ is supposed to be a seminary. Now, <clears throat> part of the problem with seminary now is not what it is, but it's what it isn't. And it isn't teaching the whole Word of God, like what Steve talked about. And we try to cover those things that, that the seminaries don't cover. And so in, in some people's mind, that, that kind of marginalizes us. But that's too bad, because if it's in the Word, it is there for our uh, doctrine and reproof and correction and instruction in righteousness. And so that's why I refer to you all as seminarians because you're here to get that lesson and it's just unfortunate if the rest of the body of Christ doesn't get it. We should be praying for them. And we should be praying for missionaries. We should be praying for, for Christians in faraway lands. We should be praying for Moses Nadawa and Price Ibrahim and some of those people that we know about that are ministering in Africa and Klaus Kugler who's ministering in Southeast Asia because they're facing things that right now in America we're not facing. But who's to say but what we may be facing that kind of persecution in the near future. And God wants us ready for that. And so it's with that in mind that we've been doing this study that I started on Tuesday about forever. Right. Yes. This is may have to do without electronics. Yep. And... and what a day that will be. Everybody turn in your Bible to Daniel chapter 12. In verse 3, in Daniel chapter 12, verse 3, there's this statement made, and we talked about this on Tuesday night. It says, the teachers and those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the firmament and those who turn many to righteousness, to uprightness and right standing with God shall give forth light like the stars forever and ever. Now as I pointed out on Tuesday night, that word shine doesn't just mean to be brilliant and to be glorious. It actually means to enlighten by way of caution. You know, you on your car, on the dashboard on your car, you have a, a, a lot of little lights that come on. Like if you're low on fuel, you will have a light that will come on that will warn you, you better go get gas pretty soon. Or you might have another light comes on that says your seat belt is not fashioned, fastened. Well, those are warning lights, and that's actually the meaning of this word shine here. That those who are wise, those who understand the things of God, those who have, uh, have been in God's seminary will shine. They will be able to warn effectively other people. That's what he's saying here in verse 3. And then in verse 10, it talks about them again. It says, Many shall purify themselves and make themselves white 
and tried and smelted and refined. Well, that's what is going to happen anytime you give your heart and life to Jesus Christ. You're going to get cleaned up, which is a good thing. But the wicked shall do wickedly. Steve talked about uh, some of the implications of that on Friday night about the, the global surveillance and so forth. They're going to do what they're going to do. And none of the wicked shall understand, but the teachers and those who are wise, the ones that shine over there in verse 3, they will understand. Now, this week, the Lord spoke to me. It was not an audible voice, but it was one of those thoughts in my mind that was loud and clear, telling me, what I, what I recall it was, cause my people to understand. So that, that was my challenge, is, is to, to help you all understand. Well, understand what? Well, of course, it's the Holy Spirit's job to help you understand the Bible when you read it. But there were three things that I was prompted that we should understand. And Steve talked about one this morning, about what is the importance of knowing end-time prophecy from, from the Scriptures? A lot of the church thinks it's not important because, oh, well, God's going to take me out here in the rapture and then the rest of the, the wicked, they'll be left to fend for themselves. So I don't need to know. Well, that's wrong. That's not what the Scripture says. Or... Another question, another thing God would like you to understand is what are the threats facing you as a Christian, as a, a born-again, spirit-filled Christian in America today? What are the threats facing you? You know what the threats facing Christians in other parts of the world are, but what are the ones facing you? Well, these are questions you need to answer for yourself and not look to me or Steve or some other minister to answer those questions for you. And then a third question is, what is spiritual maturity? Now, I'm going to answer that one for you a, a few ways here right now. Spiritual maturity, just like natural maturity, consists of a couple of things. It consists of concern for others. Go to, keep the place here in Daniel uh, and go to Philippians chapter 2. You know, one of the things that, that marks immaturity in a child is it's all about me. Well, unfortunately, the prosperity gospel in modern America has promoted an all about me mentality in the body of Christ. And that is spiritually immature. And a lot of the people who are following that don't think so. It's, oh, I'm, I'm delving into the Word. I'm finding all the blessings and promises of God, so I'm deep in the Word. Well, if it's all about you, uh, it's immature. I don't care how deep you are, you know. Because in uh, Philippians chapter 2, verse 4, it says, Let each of you esteem and look upon and be concerned for not merely his own interests, but each of you for the interests of others. Let this same attitude and purpose and mind be in you, which was in Christ Jesus, who, although being essentially one with God and in the form of God, he did not think equality with God was a thing to be eagerly grasped or retained. He didn't name it and claim it, in other words. But he stripped himself of all privileges and rightful dignity so as to assume the guise of a servant in that he became like men and was born a human being. And after that, he appeared in human form. He abased and humbled himself still further and carried his obedience to the extreme of death, even the death of the cross. And therefore, because he stooped so low, God has highly exalted him and has freely bestowed on him the name that is above every name. 
And we can read that and say, well, yes, hallelujah, Jesus did all that for me. Well, that's right, He did it for you. But what did it say there in verse 5? It said, let that be my mind be in you also. So spiritual maturity, obviously, is for us to become, have a character like Jesus, where, where we put others' needs above our own and, and we're willing to be the, the, the underdog. We're willing to be the servant, the, the slave. Uh, we're, we're willing to, to suffer abuse if necessary rather than, uh, well, it's all, you know, I'm the head, not the tail. I'm a king's kid, and I don't deserve to be treated that way. Well, Jesus certainly didn't deserve to be treated that way, did he? But he did it, and there was a reason. And it's saying here that we should be willing to be treated that way. Okay, and secondly, spiritual maturity like natural maturity, involves delaying gratification because there is a future reward. You know, ki kids who want something, they want it right now. And if you don't give it to them, they might go stick their hand in the cookie jar and take it anyway. Rather than saying, well, if you wait until after dinner, you'll have that for dessert. Oh, no, they want it right now. Well, you're here in Philippians. Go to Philippians chapter 3. Verse 18 says, For there are many of whom I have often told you and now tell you even with tears who walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. See, we're talking about being Christians over there in chapter 2. Well, this is talking about what's unchristian. They are doomed and their fate is eternal misery. Their God is their stomach. Their appetites their sensuality, what they want, what they desire, and they glory in their shame, siding with earthly things and being of their party. Now, that could hit a little bit close to home sometimes. If we want to go along with the crowd and we want to fit in and we want to be part of the status quo, well, that's their party and they're enemies of Christ. But verse 20 says, but we are citizens of the state which is in heaven. This kind of gets to what I'm going to be talking about today, about the forever kingdom. That's the title, the forever kingdom, of which we are citizens of the state that is in heaven, and from it we earnestly and patiently await the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ who will transform and fashion anew the body of our humiliation to conform to and be like the body of his glory and majesty by exerting that power which enables him to subject everything to himself. That's pretty good. Go back to Daniel. Meanwhile, back at the ranch, as they say, go to Daniel chapter 7. You know, I don't want you to hear this message <coughs> of the forever <coughs> kingdom as if this is um, pie in the sky by and by. Okay? Daniel chapter 7, verse 23. Because before you get to that state that we read about in Philippians chapter 3. There's some, uh, there's some rough road ahead. And this is part of what God wants us to understand. And I don't think we do. Uh, Daniel 7, verse 23. <clears throat> the angel said to Daniel, The fourth beast shall be a fourth kingdom on the earth, which shall be different from all the other kingdoms and shall devour the whole earth. Steve talked about the, the mechanism by which that can happen, the, the uh, electronic technological grid that's over the whole earth to return everything back to the state that was in at the Tower of Babel. It's an electronic Tower of Babel, in other words. But this is even different than that. This takes that to a new level. And it shall devour the whole earth. It shall tread it down and break it in pieces and crush it. 
And as for the ten horns, out of this kingdom ten kings shall arise, and another shall arise after them, and he shall be different from the former ones. And he shall subdue and put down three kings. And he shall speak words against the Most High God, and shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and think to change the time. Well, isn't that interesting? This is, we had the time change last night. And, of course, I talked about wearing out the saints last week, and we're not going to get worn out. We're not going to let him do that to us. So change the times and the law. You know, this is, this is a work in progress. This is not just something that, bingo, one day all of this is all of a sudden going to be way different. Everybody's going to be rattling around, wondering what to do. No, this, this has been in progress for a long time. The changing of the law, God's, God's laws, God's word is being trampled, okay? And the saints, that's us, right? The saints shall be given into his hand for a time, two times, and half a time. Now that doesn't mean we will be loyal subjects of the Antichrist. But it means he will be ruling planted earth. Planted earth. Okay? This, this world is going to be his for three and a half years. Well, you know what? That kind of shoots down the whole uh, dominionist uh, theology. Of, oh, well, we're going we're gonna to take this, this place back for Jesus and hand it to him when he comes back. Well, that doesn't fit with that, does it? It says he's going to... He is going to have his time, and it's going to be three and a half years long. And Christians are not going to be able to stop it. We, who will be here, and we'll talk about us being here a little bit today, but we who are here, we are not going to be in charge during that time of planet Earth and its governments. But we will be, it says, fed and kept safe and protected during that time. And we will be in charge of of ourselves and our our um, community, if you will. But the judgment has been set by the court of the Most High, and they shall take away his dominion, the Antichrist's dominion, and consume it and destroy it in the end. And then the kingdom and the dominion and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heavens shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all the dominions shall serve and obey him. So we will be in charge at some point, but remember, maturity involves waiting until the appropriate time for something. And I guess what I derive from what we just read there is we're not at the appropriate time for the body of Christ to be given dominion over the planet Earth. You know, you look at those powerful uh, examples of Christianity in the world and you still see way too much uh, greed. You still see way too much um, uh, pride, uh, way too much discrimination. You see things that don't look like, let this mind be in you that's in Christ Jesus. And God's going to get that fixed before he hands the kingdom of this world over to us. Okay, and we've got three and a half years to get that lesson. That's good news. We don't have to get it all in one day. And, we've, and all of us here, we've been working on that one for a long time. Well, Steve and I were talking earlier in the week. And we were saying sometimes it seems like we're broken records, that we just say the same stuff over and over. But you know, repetition is the key to learning. You know, you, you have, sometimes it takes hearing something a thousand times for it finally to, to click. And so God, God is doing that here with us. But the kingdom that he's giving us at that point in time is the kingdom that is Jesus' kingdom. So let's talk about Jesus' kingdom. You let the place in uh, Daniel go, and let's go to Luke chapter 1.
Because Jesus is going to come back to this earth to rule and reign for a thousand years. It's not off in heaven, uh, you know, after this earth is destroyed. There will be a time that this earth will be destroyed, but that's after Jesus has had a thousand years to come back and reign here. Okay? And in Luke chapter 1, verse 30, this is when the angel Gabriel was announcing to Mary that she was going to become pregnant supernaturally to carry the Messiah in her womb. And the angel Gabriel was describing to Mary who or what the Messiah, Jesus, was ultimately to be. He didn't tell her, oh, well, he's going to heal the sick and he's going to cast out demons and he's going to multiply loaves and fishes and he's going to walk on water and so on and so forth. He didn't tell her that. Here's what he told her. Luke 1, verse 30. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found grace with God and you will become pregnant and will give birth to a son and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord will give him the throne of his forefather David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob throughout the ages. And his, of his reign there will be no end. Now, back then... 2,000 years ago, that didn't come to pass in its fullness. You can say, well, spiritually it did. Okay, he, he, he has authority over the devil. He gave that authority to us, and he gave us the authority to preach the gospel throughout the world, and men have been doing that, and they're still doing it. And uh, the gates of hell will not prevail against his church. So in that sense, his kingdom did come back then, but what she has been told here about he's going to rule on the throne of his forefather David, he's, that, that hasn't happened yet. Okay, because the, the throne of his forefather David was not a, a spiritual thing. It was here in this world. Let's talk about that throne. Uh, keep the place in Luke now. Go to, uh, no, go to Psalms 89. This is the kingdom that, that we read about that's promised to Jesus over there in Daniel chapter 7. Psalm 89, verse 3. And God says, I have made a covenant with my chosen one. I have sworn to David my servant, your seed... It's another reason why I'm calling you all seminary, right? Because seed is not just the word, it's also Jesus, right? Your seed I will establish forever, and I will build up your throne for all generations. Well, you know what? After about 600 B.C., there was no Israeli king anymore, they were overtaken by the Babylonians and then by the Persians and then by the Greeks and then by the Romans and uh, then later by the, uh, by the, uh, the Mohammedans and, and that brought us into the 20th century. A and they still don't have a king. Yeah, they got a prime minister, but he's really kind of under the oversight of the global elite. So that hasn't happened. You know, it would seem as if that promise did not happen. But it's going to happen. He says, I've made a covenant. So we're going to talk about on Tuesday about when God says something, uh, it cannot be uh, altered. It cannot be violated. You can break it, but you get broken if you break it. Okay, uh, go to verse uh, 20. I have found David, my servant, my holy one, and I have anointed him with whom my hand shall be established and ever abide. My arm shall strengthen him. 
The enemy shall not exact from him or do him violence or outwit him, nor shall the wicked afflict and humble him. I will beat down his foes before his face and smite those who hate him. My faithfulness and my mercy and loving kindness shall be with him, and in my name shall his horn be exalted. I will set his hand in control on the sea and his right hand on the rivers. He shall cry to me, You are my Father, my God, the rock of my salvation. You're starting to see now, we're not just talking about David, the son of Jesse, are we? We're talking prophetically about Jesus. And I will make him the firstborn, the highest of the kings of the earth. My mercy and loving kindness will I keep for him forever, and my covenant shall stand fast and be faithful with him. His offspring, and now that's not just talking about Solomon, his offspring will I make to endure forever. Are you a child of God? Yes. This is you he's talking about. His offspring I will make to endure forever and his throne as the days of heaven. Isaiah chapter 9. Verse 6. For to us a child is born. See, this is the subtext of what the angel Gabriel said to Mary. For to us a child is born. To us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder. Yay! I just want to dance a jig when I see that. The government will be on his shoulders. And his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And of the increase of his government and of peace, there shall be no end. You see, when human governments increase, there's more and more war. You, know, you saw that with the Roman Empire. For them to continue as an empire, they just had to conquer more and more territories. And so they just sucked in all of those peoples and all of their wealth so they could go start a war somewhere else. Does that sound familiar? Okay. But that's not the way it is with Jesus. Of his, the increase of his government and of peace, there shall be no end. Upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to establish it, to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from that latter time forth even forever. And the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform it. Well, here's what that looks like. Go to Revelation chapter 19. Here's when this comes to pass in real time. Revelation chapter 19. Verse 1. After this, I heard what sounded like a mighty shout of a great crowd in heaven exclaiming, Hallelujah! Salvation and glory and power and dominion and authority belong to our God because His judgments and his condemnation and punishments and sentence of doom are true and sound and just and upright. He has judged and pronounced sentence and doomed the great and notorious harlot who corrupted and demoralized and poisoned the earth with her lewdness and adultery. And he has avenged upon her the penalty for the blood of his servants at her hand. And again they shouted, Hallelujah! The smoke of her burning shall continually ascend forever and ever throughout the eternity of eternities. And then the 24 elders of the heavenly Sanhedrin and the four living creatures fell prostrate and worshipped him who sits on the throne saying, Amen! Hallelujah! 
And then from the throne came a voice saying, Praise our God, all you servants of his, you who reverence him, both small and great. And after this, I heard what sounded like the shout of a vast throng, like the boom of many sounding waves, like the roar of a terrific and mighty peals of thunder, exclaiming, Hallelujah! For now the Lord our God, omnipotent, the all-ruler, reigns. Now that word now has some meaning. It doesn't mean, see now is what we call present tense. And this is something that is being described that's happening in the future. So in the future there is going to come a time when it happens and at that time they're going to say now it's happening. That doesn't mean that now in 2021 it's happening. And okay, and here's how we know this. Go to Revelation chapter 11. Because those who, who want to uh, ignore end time prophecy many times will do so on the claim that Jesus is already ruling the nations now that God is in control, that God is sovereign, and nothing can happen unless He ordains it. Well, does that mean that uh, He ordained the coronavirus and that He ordained the, the, the vaccines with, with uh, MNRA gene manipulating things, that God did all of that? Well, uh, you know, they've got a problem if they're going to say that. So God is not, Jesus is not ruling the nations now in, in that sense. Now he's ruling from the heavens. I guess we could say he is, he is acting as the divine umpire. But you know, that tells us something. That this tells us something we need to understand. The devil does what he does here because he, it is just and fair that he do it. And you say, well, how, how can that be? He kills, steals, and destroys. Because people are going along with his agenda. Because they think it will, it will fatten their bottom line or it will, will tickle their fancy if they go along with, with whatever his regime is. They, they agree to it. If everybody on planet Earth rebelled against the devil, then he couldn't do anything at all. Okay, he has a legal right to do it because people, by and large, if, if a vote were taken, a straw poll vote were taken, they would vote for what he says. So he, he gets to do it. But a day is coming. Revelation chapter 11, verse 15. This, this correlates with Revelation 19, verse 6. It says, the seventh angel blew his trumpet and there were mighty voices in heaven, remember? And they were shouting, dominion, kingdom, and sovereignty of the world have now, there's that word now again, come into the possession and become the kingdom of our Lord and his Christ and he shall reign forever and ever. And the 24 elders of the heavenly Sanhedrin who sat on their thrones before God prostrated themselves before him and worshiped, saying, To you we give thanks, Lord God omnipotent, who is, who was, for assuming the high sovereignty and the great power that are yours and beginning to reign. The heathen raged, but your wrath has come, and the time when the dead will be judged and your servants, the prophets, re and the saints rewarded and those who revere your name, both high and great, has come. And the time for destroying the corruptors of the earth. Well, let me ask you. Are there any destroyers of the earth walking around right now? Then that time has not come yet. All right? Well, what does this have to do with us? Go to Revelation chapter 1.
You know, I should have had my little book that has the documents of American history in it. And so I'm going to have to just kind of fake it here and tell you that the, uh, the Declaration of Independence of the, the colonies, the 13 colonies in America from Great Britain, contained a, a phrase uh, there toward the end that said, well, because of all of the things that the ruling power in London has done uh, that violate the, uh, what we call the social contract of the people, that we, the citizens of the colonies, consider ourselves to be independent of Great Britain. That we are, in fact, our own sovereign nation. And that was signed in July the 4th, 1776. So it took another, what was it, six years? Or five years anyway, and, and a lot of war before Great Britain finally agreed to that uh, assessment of things. But we considered that the United States of America came into existence in 1776, even though Great Britain didn't acknowledge that until 1781, I think it was. So what, what we are seeing here in Revelation chapter 1 is that our 1776 was the resurrection of Jesus Christ in A.D. whatever it was, 30, 33, whatever. But uh, the devil, our Great Britain, if you will, according to the metaphor I'm using, has not acknowledged our uh, independence from him yet. Okay? But just as Thomas Jefferson and George Washington and all of them were free from the control of Great Britain, after 1776, we are free from the control of the devil and his minions. And if the government, any government, the United States of America, the state of Texas, the city council of Fort Worth, if any government demands of you something contrary to what the word of God says you are to obey, you must obey the word of God and not that government. And you know, this is not a new idea. Henry David Thoreau, back in the 1840s, decided that the United States going in and declaring war on Mexico and taking Texas and Arizona and all these places, that that was unjust. And, and therefore, he was not going to pay taxes uh, to the federal government for whatever it was they were collecting taxes for. And it wasn't income tax. It might be just you know, coffee or tea or something. I don't know. But he, he refused to pay the tax, so they threw him in jail. But he didn't have to sit there very long because he made his case to a judge and the judge thought about it and said, you know what, you're right. And so he let him out. And Thoreau wrote this, this little treatise called On Civil Disobedience, which became the text for Martin Luther King and for civil rights sit-ins and so on and so forth. That there is a right to disagree with that which you consider immoral and unrighteous. It, before Almighty God, you have the right to refuse to obey any edict or mandate put upon you that is wrong in your, in your view. Now, they may fire you, so then you're going to have to, you know, stand on your faith and believe for God to supply your needs. Or if, if you have some wealthy backer, maybe you'll bring a lawsuit against your your boss and they'll go to some circuit court somewhere and those people will either accept it or throw it out. Whatever. I mean, you can pray about that too. But point being, here in Revelation chapter 1, verse 4, let's start at verse 4. Well, let's kind of ooze into this. Uh, John, to the seven assemblies that are in Asia, may God's grace and peace uh, from him who is, who was, who is to come, and from the sevenfold Holy Spirit that is before the throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful and trustworthy witness, the firstborn of the dead, the prince of the kings of the earth. See, this is acknowledging his um, reign in the, in the, the covenant of David. 
To him, whoever loves us and once and for all has loosed us and freed us from our sins by his own blood and has formed us into a kingdom, a royal race, priests to his God, to him be glory and power and majesty and dominion throughout the ages forever and ever. Amen, so be it. So now you are part of the kingdom of Jesus Christ if you are born again. And he paid for it 2,000 years ago with his blood, but you got it when you gave your heart and life to him. Luke chapter 11. No, Luke chapter 12. Verse 24. Observe and consider the ravens. They neither sow nor reap, for they have neither storehouse nor barn, yet God feeds them. Of how much more worth are you than the birds? And which of you, by being overly anxious and troubled with, the care, with cares, how many can add a cubit to his stature? or a moment of time to his age. If then you're not able to do such a little thing, why are you anxious and troubled with cares about the rest? Consider the lilies, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin or weave. Yet I tell you, not even Solomon in all of his glory was arrayed like one of them. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the furnace, how much more will he clothe you, O oh, you people of little faith? And you, do not seek by meditating and reasoning to inquire into what you are to eat, what you are to drink, or be anxious, <clears throat> excited, or troubled, or kept in suspense. For the pagan world is greedily seeking after these things. And your father knows that you need them. Only aim at and strive for <clears throat> and seek his kingdom. <clears throat> That's the, the point here today. We have a kingdom that we are part of that we should understand what it means. We should, we should be giving the same amount of uh, energy toward our um, occupying a place in God's kingdom as we are into uh, our occupying our place at whatever our address is and, and, you know, making sure that our bills are paid and that our taxes are paid and that our driver's licenses are up to date and that, that our yard is mowed and all these things. He's not saying you don't, don't be concerned about any of that, but he says, first and foremost, there's this kingdom that you are part of that you should be cultivating just like you're cultivating all of that other stuff. He said, and do not be seized with alarm and struck with fear, little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. See, in other words, it's not like, well, if I'm just a good enough Christian, if I'll just witness to enough people or read enough Bible or pray in tongues enough or sing enough songs, then maybe I'll somehow manage to get the kingdom. No. <clears throat> he says, if you're in Christ, you have the kingdom. You know, it's said, and I didn't see the data on this last one, but it's said that a very small percentage of people vote. You know, we had an election this week. Uh, it was about uh, school taxes or something. In some, some cities, it was about some things in their government. But 
I, I'm guessing that somewhere less than 10% of people vote, especially on things like that. And maybe it'll rise to, you know, close to 50% if it's a presidential election. But if it affects everybody in a town or in a state, and, and folks, I'm gonna, I'm gonna confess my sin. I didn't vote either. I'll tell, you, I'll tell you why I didn't vote. Because I prayed about it and the Lord said, well, do you, know, do you really know what these issues are and do you know the pros and cons of each one and do you know what you're voting on? I said, no. And he said, well, then just pray and leave it in my hands. So that's a vote. Actually, that is a vote. If you, if, if you feel like, hey, you know, I, I can't, I don't know what this is really going on. Lord, you, you settle it. You know, you said you'd settle the causes and cases of your people. Then you have voted, essentially. But most citizens don't even do that. They just blow it off. Well, we are part of the kingdom of God. And unfortunately, what we are tend to do is we get so wrapped up in the things of life that we blow that off. We get to vote in it. You, you get to decide whether you're going to participate in His kingdom or not. You get to decide whether you're going to let Christ live in you. You get to decide whether His power is going to flow through you and in you and renew your mind and heal your body and, and give you peace or not. We get to do that. It's available, in other words. Luke chapter 17. And uh, this is not a Ray Andrews idea. Jesus said this. Luke 17, verse 20. Asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come. He replied to them by saying, The kingdom of God does not come with signs to be observed and with a visible display. Nor will people say, look, here it is. See, it's there. For behold, the kingdom of God is within you. It's in your hearts. And it's among you and it's surrounding you. He's a very present help in time of trouble, I think it was said this morning. Luke chapter 22. There are a couple of things that the kingdom of God is not. Luke 22, verse 24. Now an eager contention arose among them which of them was considered and reputed to be the greatest. Oh boy, have we not seen that throughout history. Not just Peter and James and John, but Baptist and Methodist and Pentecostals and Catholics and, and Orthodox. And, you know, uh, among the Baptists, there's the Southern Baptist and the Northern Baptist and the Independent Baptist and the Primitive Baptists, etc., right? Okay, well, I think we can relate to this. Who would be the greatest? But Jesus said to them, the kings of the Gentiles are deified, and they exercise lordship over them, and those in authority over them are called benefactors and well-doers. But this is not to be so with you. On the contrary, let him who is the greatest among you become like the youngest, and him who is the chief and leader like one who serves." For who is the greatest, the one who reclines at the table or the one who serves? It's, is it not the one who reclines at the table? But I am in your midst as one who serves. And those of you who have remained and persevered with me in my trials, as my Father has appointed a kingdom and conferred it on me, so do I confer it on you that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. But what is it not? It's not one-upsmanship. It's not competition. It's not who's the greatest, who's the, who's the king of the mountain. It's not that. First Corinthians, keep 
Uh, you can let the place in Luke go. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 4. Here's something else. The kingdom of God is not. You know, sometimes for us to know what something is, we have to know what it isn't. Okay? And just like, you know, that uh, domination and control is not what the kingdom of God is about. Well, here's something else. 1 Corinthians 4, verse 19. And Paul is saying, I will come to you shortly if the Lord is willing, and then I will perceive and understand what is the talk of these puffed up and arrogant spirits. Not just what they say, but their force, their moral power and excellence of soul that they possess. For the kingdom of God consists of and is not based on talk, but on power. Moral power and excellence of soul. In other words, it's not just that you can talk the talk, but you're walking the walk. And he's saying there that even back then, there were those who were making claims uh, in order to get other people to uh, respect them, to, uh, to follow them. And, and that seems to be, uh, th there seems to be a tendency among humans that if somebody will, will be bold and be uh, aggressive, that there's sort of a tendency on most people to think, oh, well, that guy must know what he's doing, so I better, I better fall in line behind him. Where's he going? What, what kind of life is he leading? You know, if you follow him, are you going to go off a cliff? Are you going to say, well, it must be okay because brother so-and-so does it. That, that, that won't hold water with God. That's not what his kingdom is based upon. It says it's <clears throat> moral power and excellence of soul. Now, uh, here again, there's some words here that have earned some un, unnecessary negative contents in, uh, context in the body of Christ. You know, moral? Oh no, that, that's old covenant. You know, we don't live by morals. We live by the Spirit. Well, you know what? The Holy Spirit is never, N-E-V-E-R, the Holy Spirit will never influence you to do something that is immoral, that is contrary to God's precept. Okay, you can eat shrimp. Okay, you can eat bacon. You can wear, you can wear a fabric that is part cotton and part polyester. Okay, but, but God, the Holy Spirit will never tell you it's okay for you to have sex outside of marriage between a man and a woman. Okay, the Holy Spirit will never tell you it's okay to, to pilfer from the till because after all, they're rich and they don't need all that money. That's called moral excellence. And um, of your soul, it has to do with your emotions. You know, this is something that the, the body of Christ has gotten a little bit fuzzy about. It's like, well, if I feel such a thing, then that must be God. <laughs> No, nope. sorry. The devil can influence your feeler too. Keep the place in 1 Corinthians. Go to Romans chapter 14. Here's a third thing that the kingdom of God is not. You know, it's not domination and control. It's not just talk without walk. And it's not, well, I'll just let Scripture read it. 1 Corinthians. Uh, Romans chapter 14, verse 16. Do not therefore let what seems good to you be considered an evil thing by someone else. In other words, do not give occasion to others to criticize that which is justifiable for you. You know, you might think, well, hey, I'm not under the law. There's no condemnation to me. So, God's okay with it, so why aren't you okay with it? Well, uh, you know, that's a can of worms there, why they might not be okay with it. But let's keep reading here. It says, after all, 
The kingdom of God is not a matter of food and drink. It's a, not a matter of getting what you like. See, this is one of the things that the, the prosperity gospel has corrupted Christians thinking, well, 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 God's just there, you know, for me to pull the string so I can get what I like. He says, no, that's not the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is not, God is not just there for you to get what you like, but it's righteousness the state which makes a person acceptable to God, it's heart, peace, and it's joy in the Holy Spirit. Well, let me say something about joy. The Holy Spirit's not the only source people can get joy from. People can get joy from watching a football game when their team wins. People can get joy from imbibing alcohol. So it's not joy for joy's sake. It's joy that when it's the Holy Spirit, it's a fruit of the Spirit, okay? And part of spiritual maturity is us coming to discern what is spiritual and what is emotional. You know, it says that the Word of God is, is quicker and sharper than a two-edged sword, and it can divide those things. Um, verse 18, For he who serves Christ in this way is acceptable and pleasing to him and is approved by man. And even if they criticize you, then if they're really put on the spot, say, yeah, he's doing right. And I don't like it, but I don't like it because he's making me look bad. <laughs> so then, let us definitely aim for and eagerly pursue what makes for harmony and mutual upbuilding, edification and development of one another. Amen. So go back to 1 Corinthians, let's go to chapter 11 and prepare to receive the Lord's Supper here. First Corinthians 11 verse 23, for I received from the Lord himself that which I passed on to you. It was given to me personally that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was treacherously delivered up and while his betrayal was in progress, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this to call me affectionately to remembrance. And similarly, when supper was ended, he took the cup also, saying, this cup is the new covenant ratified and established in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it to call me affectionately to remembrance. Now, I want to say something about covenants. Remember that the kingdom of David that was bestowed upon Jesus was by covenant. We'll talk more about this in another message, but a covenant you cannot break. You, you, can, you can walk away from it, but you cannot change. The, it, it's not like, uh, you know, you're, we, we think of covenants maybe as a will and testament. And, you know, that, that terminology has been used for the new covenant. But a human will and testament, you can come back years later and say, well, you know, I think I'm going to write somebody this or that out of my will. God's covenants are not like that. That's right. It is. That's okay. Now, we, we do have an old covenant and a new covenant. And there, I mean, you can make a covenant with this person and then you can say, okay, no, I'm going to make a covenant with everybody. You know, I can say, okay, I made an agreement with my next door neighbor that, that I would mow the, the, the easement in front of their yard. Okay, and so you do that. But then maybe you become... Uh, mayor of Fort Worth and say, I'm going to make an agreement with the whole city of Fort Worth. We're going to send crews out and mow everybody's yard. Okay. Well, thank you, Tom. Okay. Well, that's kind of like what the Old Covenant versus the New Covenant is. God said, okay, for Israel, if you'll keep these rules right here, I'll do this for you. And what Jesus, what the New Covenant that Jesus has done, saying, no, we're going we're gonna to do something better than that. We're, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cover the sins of all humanity if they will believe in me, if they will accept me as their sacrifice. Okay? 
So, this is the covenant that he has made. And, and every time, verse 26, and every time you eat the bread and drink the cup, you are representing and signifying and proclaiming the fact of the Lord's death until he comes. That's what we're doing. And whoever eats and drinks the cup of the Lord in a way that's unworthy of him will be guilty of profaning and sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. For let a man thoroughly examine himself, and only when he has done so should he eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discriminating and recognizing with due appreciation that it's Christ's body eats and drinks a sentence, a verdict of judgment upon himself. And that careless and unworthy participation is the reason many of you are weak and sickly, and quite enough of you have fallen into the sleep of death. And you know what he's warning about there in verse 29 and verse 30 would be what a person would be doing if they say, well, okay, it's the first Sunday of the month, and so we always do the Lord's Supper on the first Sunday of the month, so I'm going to go drink that little cup of grape juice and have that little piece of, of unleavened bread that Tammy bakes, and it's like just, it's just a habit. It says, well, you know, you're not, you're not getting the benefit of the new covenant then. He's not saying you're going to hell, but he's saying that, you know, don't be surprised then if later on down in the week you're just suffering just like the rest of the world is because you're not acting like you're part of God's kingdom. You're acting like you're just a worldly person and this is just, a, you know, another little rigmarole, rigmarole that we do on Sundays. No, this is not just a rigmarole. And... You know, we don't have to do it on the first Sunday of every month. Sometimes we don't. That's not the point. The point is not that, you know, you have to set your clock by it. Um, verse 31. But if we would searchingly examine ourselves and detect our shortcomings and recognize our condition, we should not be judged and penalty decreed. That's, that's that business of Changing your way of thinking. That's what repentance means, is think differently. He's asking us to think differently. But if we do fall short and are judged by the Lord, we're disciplined and chastened so that we may not finally be condemned to eternal punishment along with the world. So let's prepare ourselves to receive the Lord's Supper, shall we?